Today we're on the cusp of the sixth new great extinction of species in the history of life on Earth. And it's not the external or environmental events that are causing this one. This new wave of biodiversity loss is caused by a single species, mankind. Our planet's biodiversity, which is essential for our very survival, is in danger. Some might see the destruction of our habitats, wildlife and ecosystems as a problem of tomorrow. But by not tackling this problem today, it spells disaster for future generations. Over the last century, Ireland has suffered huge losses in biodiversity. Intensive monoculture farming with excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides has pushed species like the corncrake, grouse, curlew, and others like the grey partridge to the brink of extinction. Sprawling developments, new roads and pollution have fragmented existing habitats, such as wetlands and small woodlands. Floodplains have been encroached upon and bogs overcut and drained. Our natural ecosystem services like pollination, healthy soil for crop growing and clean water are being destroyed and the destruction is accelerating every year. To halt this loss, certain habitats across the country have been designated as special areas of conservation or special protection areas. I'm meeting Andy Bleasdale from our National Parks and Wildlife Service to discuss the pressures on these special areas. The species that we have in Ireland are under threat and as time passes the threat increases. In particular wader species that we would have expected as being widespread in the Irish countryside are becoming more and more under threat and because of that those species are now listed as European species of conservation concern. So what happens now if we don't manage these species and look after them? The consequence of not managing these species is ultimately that those species become extinct in Ireland and ultimately the same pattern may be delivered across Europe also. So while we have these species here, the onus is on us and on Ireland to protect and enhance the habitats in which those species occur. And obviously to do that then we need to work with the farmers who farm those lands. We have a high proportion of land in Ireland designated for nature conservation. So the SACs, the Special Areas of Conservation, the Special Protection Area for Birds are all driven by European directives and put a bit of an onus in Ireland to protect those habitats and species. The total hectare of land, terrestrial land mass in Ireland is 7 million hectares. Uh, approximately 13.5% of that is designated and something like 80% of that land is farmed by farmers. So I would say something in the order of a million hectares would be farmland that would be managed uh, in the Nature 2000 network. In Ireland, one of the big extensive habitats that we have are the uplands. These types of habitats would occupy, I would say, approximately 50% of our SAC network. So it's a, there's an important onus on Ireland to protect the uplands. Ireland's biodiversity has adapted over the last 5,000 years alongside low impact farming. Cattle and sheep grazing on marginal land has always been a part of our traditional landscape and cultural heritage. As this type of farming heritage disappears, huge habitats can be left abandoned. If these areas are not actively grazed, they become dense scrubland, uninhabitable for native wildlife species. This is an example of mountain vegetation, such as grasses, heathers, gorse, bracken, rhododendron, that have been left grow out of control. And this undergrazing is caused by farmers not being incentivized to manage the grasslands that they have been doing for thousands of years before this. The new habitats we've left in SACs and SPAs are very sensitive and need just the right kind of care. Here in the valley of Glenmalure in County Wicklow, Pat Dunn has an upland SAC on his farm where his flock of sheep helps manage the issue of undergrazing. The sheep we run, they're Wicklow Cheviot yaws. The most of them, we put Cheviot rams to them because we have to keep the continuity going for breeding the yaw lamb for the, going back to the mountain. It's very important that the lamb has to get reared on the mountain for to get used to it, build up an immunity against disease, all that type of thing. This is the longest glacial valley in the British Isles. You know, it's difficult terrain, and you always have to be very alert, and you always have to be watching 
everything that happens. You're trying to watch weather events, you're trying to watch everything that can take place. If you look at the side of that mountain, you see nothing much, only bracken. But once you raise the, over the top of it there, there's quite good grazing out there. That's different, different type of grazing. And if you don't graze that, what happens to it? It becomes overgrown. If the vegetation comes so high, it's no good for stock, it's no good for walkers, there's no good for biodiversity. In my estimation, it's no good for anything then. And it's just abandoned land. A lot of farmers in the uplands here find it very hard to actually farm the mountains and it's not rewarding enough for them to do so. Do you think that's a problem? Yes. It's hard work and little reward. We're really dependent on the check in the post, unfortunately, because when I sell my stock and I add it all up against the costs, I'm really only at break-even point. So I depend then on the single payment. That's my wages. I think we need an upland payment scheme because the most cost-effective way that you can possibly manage the mountains is by keeping farmers working the mountains. And if they pick up the skills, you know, that has been there for generations, has been handed down from father to son for generations, the younger people would pick it up. There's so many people going away from farming, from hill farming now at the moment. Those skills will be lost, and that's a real tragedy. Because as things are at the moment, a young man would not be able to rear a family, pay a mortgage from hill farming. Do you see a continuity of farming up in the uplands? I would love to see it. We have formed a group. We have a National Parks and Wildlife man. We have Chagas representative. We have Mountaineer in Ireland. You know, it's, it's a broad-based group, but everybody has the same interest. Everybody can see that there's abandonment of the hills. And everybody sees the need for the try and hold onto the farmers that's there because if the skill of farming is lost, hill farming is lost, it will be gone, be gone forever. So if we're serious about supporting biodiversity and high nature value farming in Ireland, then we really need to support farmers like Pat. His suggestion of an upland farm payment scheme that rewards biodiversity protection is an interesting idea and one that could incentivize other farmers with the proposed cap reforms that are now coming down the line, this is a critical time to set up reward schemes for nature conservation measures. At the moment, there's approximately 55 billion euros spent across Europe on the common agricultural policy. So across the cap, there's a huge range of objectives. It has to basically produce food, produce a high quality environment, maintain water quality, mitigate against climate change. To simplify it down slightly, what they've done is targeted the payments into two specific pillars. Pillar one really deals with food security and food production and market stability measures. And that involves direct payments to farmers. And together with these direct payments, they have to attain some basic uh, environmental and animal welfare standards. Then pillar two really is our rural development budget that has, it is everything else, all our other objectives bar our food security and food production objectives. Preservation of ecosystems, biodiversity, moving towards a low carbon economy. Yet pillar two for biodiversity protection only gets a small fraction of the 55 billion euros spent on CAP. If we're to maintain our SACs and SBAs across Europe, surely CAP needs to address this imbalance. I'm now in Roscommon, on the western bank of Loch Ree, where Anya Murray from Birdwatch Ireland is going to introduce me to a farmer who is a wetland SAC on his farm. A lot of people think that the most important sites for nat nature conservation are, are habitats that aren't farmed, whereas in fact a lot of what we have in our protected areas, uh, especially extensively grazed grasslands, the farming is essential to maintain the biodiversity value or the conservation value of those sites. Porig's farm is really super for wildlife. He's got a mixed farm, he's got cattle, he's got sheep, he's got crops, he's got linnet cover. Podrick's farm is not only designated as a special area of conservation, but also a special protection area and a national heritage area. 
So how much of your land is in SAC? There's 37 and a half acres out of the 40 acres that's here in SAC. So, there is. so um, is it SPA too? It's SPA in HA, yes. All three? All three on the lockery, on the lockery yes. Look, at when we were doing the, the hedgerows, we got some extra plants. All native species? All native species. You have uh, spindle, gilder rose, bird cherry, hazel, holly. Does this flood in the winter? Yeah, you probably ha you could have up to uh, three feet of water on this in right. the winter, depending on the flood. Get a lot of um, breed winter and wetland birds on the on the site here. You get uh, snipe, lapwing. You're not going to make an intensive farm out of this, no matter what you do, because you get a high flood in the in the summer or in the winter and your 40 acres is reduced maybe to 15 or 20 acres. So a lot of farmers has actually abandoned that land because it's not viable. You go to all the preparation work, you put your fences down, you move your animals in. The next thing you get three days rain, you have to take all your animals out again. And as you as a farmer, can you make a living here? Uh, I mean, you're not full-time farmer, are you? No, there's no. no possible way that you'd make a living here. but. Our, our, our holding here may be unique, but there's people that has farms all around about the west of Ireland that no matter what they're doing, they're not going to make a living out of, out of their farm. Podrick is maintaining important habitats on his farm. His trees and hedgerows alone attract wild birds while also producing biodiversity. Yet within the cap, there is no support for his work. At the moment, the Common Agricultural Policy cap uh, spends 75% of its budget on direct payments to farmers. That's one billion euro a week. The payments are linked, they're, they're called historically referenced, so they're linked to levels of productivity uh, 10 years ago. The proposal at the moment that's being debated in Europe is that there's a flat rate payment, so there's the same rate of payment for every hectare of land in the country. And that's a much fairer system. The smaller farmers tend to produce more of what we call public goods. They produce biodiversity, they support strong rural communities, their, their income where it's difficult to attract outside investment. And we want them to get the same amount that the intensive farmers are getting because it's public money and it should be tied to the delivery of public goods. Other SACs of great importance are our peatlands. These comprise blanket bogs in the mountain upland areas and raise bogs like Clara Bog here in the Midlands. They're amongst the rarest and most threatened habitats in Europe, and as such are designated as priority SACs. The raised bogs in particular are in, in very, very poor condition. What we've essentially got left at this stage, we've got about 16% of our original area of raised bog. Uh, the situation with the blanket bogs is not so bad because they are are much more extensive, but they also have been very, very badly damaged. And the blanket bogs, I just want to stress, are, are really quite rare at a world level, whereas raised bogs are slightly more common. Less than 1% of the original area of raised bog is in good condition. And is this part of our 1% that you're talking this about? Is part, this is part of our 1%. What condition is it in? Uh, very severely damaged. Um, if you look, over here, you'll see that uh, the, the, the bog is higher there, and then it slopes down and gets lower and lower, and here it then levels out again. Now, if you had a fully intact raised bog, you should just have a fairly flat line against the skyline. So what's causing all this damage? Well, in, this, in the case of this bog, it's basically been drainage associated with turf cutting. And can you actually kind of recover this bog to a level where it would be back to its formal? Can you, you no, can't really no, no, raise this back up, can you? You can't, I mean, uh, what you, you, you're starting off from a, uh, in, in a way, a sort of a new situation. What you're trying to do is provide all the plants and animals out on the bog with a continuing home. So you have to work on that very, very carefully. You have to try to expand the areas which are actively growing and you have to know where you can do that. And in other cases, you won't be able to do that. It will just be physically impossible. You want to remember that these bogs took 
10,000 years to form. They took basically carbon out of the atmosphere. They fixed it. They used that to grow slowly at about one millimeter per year. We have lost about a meter in depth of this uh, bog in this area here. That would take a very, very long time at one millimeter a year to uh, grow back. A thousand years. A thousand years. What we would need to do is block up the drains and put little dams to hold the water back a little bit. You need to have a, a very clear idea of what you're doing to make sure that you're holding the water where you need to hold the water and that you're doing the least you need to do to give the bog a long-term future. Our ecosystems need to be resilient if they're to continue providing essential services. Bogs act like massive sponges, soaking up water and can prevent flooding. They also clean our water and act as a valuable carbon sink when working properly. If we can prove that restoration works, Ireland could be paid through an emissions trading scheme to protect them. Halting biodiversity loss in Ireland by 2020 won't be possible unless at least half the entire CAP funding goes towards rural development to support agri-environment and biodiversity protection measures on farmland. Surely this would be a fairer way to spend money that is essentially public. What I would like to see is a more targeted and tailored common agricultural policy. Well, the job has started at the moment in terms of our rural development programme, but over the next 12 months, if we don't get that correct in terms of identifying what are the appropriate, the needs of these areas right, what are the priorities for them areas, what are the different farming systems, what are the environmental products that's required from these areas, and set this within the common framework, which is the priorities that are set for Europe as a whole, then we will not get the Rural Development Programme right from 2014 to 2020. Here in County Meath, Catherine Keena from Chagask is working with an intensive farmer who is a wetland SAC on his land. The reason I brought you down here to Bartles Farm is he's a good example. It's a, he's a commercial farmer with a dairy herd. He has land that's farmed intensively and then he has another area that's farmed extensively with not so many stock. And some of that extensively farmed land is a river SSC. This is the, the River Boyne and River Blackwater SPA, which means Special Protection Area. So all and of this is your land here? All of this is our land. Here. And it comes from Loch Rammer? Loch Rammer. Yeah, Loch Rammer. in okay. Cavan. Right. Would you call this now high nature value farming here? Absolutely, because what you want is the animals grazing this, keeping it open. This yeah. is the right way to manage uh, this is a, a high nature value farm, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, this is lovely to see animals, you know, in as far as I say, the wrong thing is to fence these areas off and then they become scrubbed up, too dense, the ducks can't get into the water, you know, you have too dense a vegetation, the yeah. birds can't move through it. So Bartle, why is this a special area of conservation? Well, because it's a fantastic area here for, for birds. Uh, we have the kingfisher, which flies right over the river here, and they nest in the banks here on the side of the river. We also have a lot of otters here, uh, which is a very good healthy sign that the river is clean. The reason the wildlife is here is because the farming systems have, have suited them. So what we want to do is continue the farming systems that suit the, the wildlife that are on, in these special places. It's about not coming near the river bank, not spreading slurry or fertiliser. Now on this particular field here, there's never any chemical fertiliser spread on this field. So how do you feel about now not having this intensively farmed? down here? Well, we can intensively farm the rest of the farm. Like, to keep away from the river bank is a good idea. It keeps the wildlife happy, and without the wildlife then we wouldn't have all these people visiting our farm. They like the nature walks. It's, it's a fantastic area around here with heritage and history. Whatever is decided this year will set the direction for the EU's common agricultural policy for the next seven years. Policy makers are already making decisions on how to distribute the annual 55 billion euro budget. Whether small family farms will benefit or whether the majority of the money will continue to subsidise large industrial farmers remains to be seen. The prospects for our future are bleak if we don't address biodiversity objectives through more profound policy changes. 
Here in Ireland, we already have a model that could be used as a blueprint for further projects. The Burn Farming for Conservation programme incentivizes farmers to produce biodiversity measures. The Burn method could serve as a framework for the development of an innovative payment for ecosystem services projects across the entire country. Brenton, is all of this land here now an SAC? This would all be some of the best SAC you'll find anywhere in Europe. This would be species rich grasslands and limestone pavement. In the Burn Farming for Conservation programme at present we have about 160 farmers, uh, but those cover about 50% of the burn landscape. So it's a, it's a very significant programme for a very small amount of money. So we microfund little projects on these farms which help the management of the farm. So that's really important, the infrastructure. We co-fund those jobs with the farmer. The second element is a performance related element. Simply we assess this field in terms of how well managed it is for biodiversity and for cultural uh, features and for water quality. And we rate each field out of 10 every year and that rating translates into an income for the farmer. So if the farmer chooses to manage this place very well and puts the work in, he'll score quite high and he'll earn a good income. If the farmer decides this is not for me, he doesn't bother, he'll earn very little if nothing. We're going to visit one of our best farmers, I suppose. His name is Pat Neagle. Good to see you. How are you? Thanks very much. This Hi, is Duncan. Pat. Duncan, you're going to see you. The bottom. Thank you very much, yes. and I believe yes. this is your farm here, yeah? This is, our, this is our farm here. Our farm at home is 63 acres, and we'd, we'd suckle 40 cows in that for the summer. And them would, they would the cows then that come to the mountain in, the, in October. All going well, you'll bring them back down again the following year. Is the farming now done here like it was done traditionally in the past? Oh, it is. It's very, the very same. No difference. Since I was a child, it's the f same s system that's used. And if you look at that stone yeah. wall there now, do you have to maintain that? We have to maintain that. It has to be kept at, at that kind of a standard. So is this a stone fort in over here? No, no, Duncan. This is, this is only a mohur. Oh, right. A What's a mohur? A mohur is, is something where they used to gather cattle one time. I'll put them in if they had a cow calf. And, all oh, right, they so they could collect them in they here. Collect them and put them in there. Like with all of these beautiful now wildflowers here, would they have been all kind of covered over with briars? They'd all have been covered over with briars and bushes. This is a, a blueprint, I'd say, for the whole of Ireland. There's no way that this wouldn't work if you got the will of the farmers to get them thinking. Now it took a long time. There was a five-year study done here in here in the Burren, and that's what started off that interest. And then the farmers got to work with the people rather than they're working again. them. We're all working together. This is a very simple programme in terms of how it operates. Very little bureaucracy, farmer-led, payment for results and also freedom to farm. Those three things are key to farmers, not just here in the barn, but anywhere in Ireland that I've been. And the really good thing about here is it's not a theory, it's something we've been practising here for three years in one of the most complex landscapes in Ireland. And it works really, really well for the farmer, for the landscape and for society because it's terrific value for money. Well, the farmers in the burn have really now a good solution to solving this problem. And farmers around the country, like them, can be incentivised through similar schemes. But if we don't act now and reform the cap in such a way that it really looks after and incentivises these farmers, we're going to lose all of this wonderful biodiversity. The flat rate payment for distributing CAP funds would be a much fairer approach. At the moment, the portion of CAP funds that's essential for nature conservation and biodiversity is at risk of being slashed. An effective way of resolving this could be to prioritise SACs, SPAs and extensive high nature value farmland with targeted measures that reward farmers based on environmental performance. This concept would mean CAP would support active farmers only, who produce food efficiently, sustainably and in harmony with nature, rather than supporting armchair farmers. Mankind has asserted such mastery over this planet. Surely now, with their accumulated knowledge, past history and current technology, it's time to respect our biodiversity. The choice is ours.